Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, family. My name is Alice, and I'm a grateful, grateful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. My sobriety date is May 21st, 1987, and while time isn't the only thing in Alcoholics Anonymous that matters, only people without it say it doesn't matter. Hmm, How about that part? So I want to actually, I usually start by thanking all the people who do service, Um, and and this is such a beautiful meeting um, that you guys have already done that. So I want to start by, um, first of all, thanking my brother Ali for the partnership that he and Teresa have formed in order to create this space. Throughout the pandemic, every Tuesday to be here and bring someone in to share their own journey. And in, in, in the journey that really matters, how have you developed your relationship with God? Where are you in the seeking this conscious contact? And then before I start, I also want to um, just take a moment and talk about Um, the friendship with Teresa. Um, We're both bumping in the dark, man, bumping in the dark about how to be in intimate relationship, right? Because it's not my long suit. I am deeply hermetic. Um, I'm a super duper introvert. Um, If we didn't ever go back to live meetings, I'd be okay with that, right? People like go to live meetings and man, I love Zoom. I love Zoom. And um, I'm happy that I joined you here, T. So, um, When Ali reached out to me to do this, it's always an honor. It really is. And my prayer since he and I text earlier today has been that God remove me, get me out of the way, and allow me to crack myself open, right, for you so that I can share with you the journey that I've been on. I want to say something before I tell you about the topic about where I'm at right now today. So, um... I've been here 35 years. I got to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 26. I'm 61. Do the math for you. And um, I retired at 57. And, um, you know, I'm a traveler. And so I've traveled a lot. I'm trying to see the whole world. And then the pandemic happened, right? And it sat me down. And it's been this period of very deep reflection. Um. It's one thing to be invited to speak someplace. It's a different deal to be invited to invited back. And so I was here before and, and I talked about the section of the 12 and 12 in the 11 step that talks about that self-examination is important. Prayer is important. Meditation is important. But when they're thoughtfully, intentionally combined and woven together, they create an unshakable foundation for our life, which is important because when I got here, I don't even know that I had a foundation. And if I had one, man, wobbly, wobbly, it was certainly, the wind would blow me down, right? Because nobody gets to Alcoholics Anonymous on a good day. If you got to Alcoholics Anonymous on a good day, please call me. I want to hear about that. If everything was going your way, you had plenty of money, your job was great, your relationships were great, oh, it was lovely. Call me because I really want to hear about that. In the 35 years that I've been here, Everybody that I know got the gift of desperation and that gift of desperation, which feels like the worst thing that could happen, ends up being a gift, one of the greatest gifts in our life. And so right now I'm in this place where about nine months ago, I got a health diagnosis that um, a type two diabetes diagnosis, which was devastating. And I went and got a nutritional therapist. I didn't know there was such a thing. And what she said to me was, and then I'm going to go to the topic, that diabetes is a diagnosis that reflects years, if not decades, of self-neglect and abuse. Well, I'm devastated. My hair is lovely. My shoes and pocketbooks match. My wardrobe is coordinated. My house is fabulous. What are you talking about? And what it forced me to do is to to go deeper, to go deeper. 
because I believe what the 11th step is, is offering me is an ongoing, never-ending journey into this consciousness with the power that I've always been connected to, as evidenced by the fact that I have breath in my body. That is the evidence that the power has always been here. It's me that's awakening to the consciousness of it. And ultimately, the power for me is love. And how can I love you if I don't love me? And so the journey, the place that I'm in right now, 35 years, man, is this falling into a deeper place of self-love. So um, in the 12 and 12, on page 105, in the bottom paragraph, right in the middle, I'm going to talk about this sentence. The moment we catch even a glimpse of God's will, the moment we begin to see truth, justice, and love as real and eternal things in life, we are no longer deeply disturbed by all of the seeming evidence to the contrary that surrounds us in purely human affairs. Wow. Wow. So I want to talk about my experience with the 11th step related to this as a topic. In many ways, I think that this sentence is talking about the fourth dimension that we get rocketed to. So in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, on page 100, the first full paragraph, both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. If we persist, if we persist, remarkable things will happen. And then we realize the things that came to us when we put our hands, ourselves in God's hands was better than anything we could have planned. And then the, par- the sentence I love. I presently live in a new and wonderful world no matter what my present circumstance. And I believe even though that is in the 12th step, right, and working with others, that it's talking about when I am in the world of the spirit, that it can be a new and wonderful world, no matter what is happening in the material world, no matter what's happening in the human affairs. In this sentence, The moment we catch a glimpse, see, I catch a glimpse, which is why I'm seeking. I'm always seeking. I'm always seeking. My seeking is endless. My seeking is endless. When I catch even a glimpse of God's will, the moment that I begin to see that these things are eternal, what things? Truth, justice, and love. They're real. Now, they might not be real in the material world. They might not be real in human affairs. I just need to preface this statement that I'm about to make. The 10th tradition in Alcoholics Anonymous tells us that our group cannot have, ought never have, an opinion on outside issues. That tradition does not talk to me about having an opinion. Okay, y'all ready? I'm a free black woman in America. I swear to God, that's true. And that, my friends, is a revolution. Call me. I want to talk to you about that because I want you to be my ally on this journey. Because you can be in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and be unwelcomed, feel unwelcomed, feel cast aside, feel not good enough. Oh, it's happened to me. I moved to a new town and went to the little meeting down the street. And sat down. The meeting happened in the sanctuary. And it's empty. The people are in their fellowship, and I don't know nobody. I told you I'm a hermit. I was just sitting in the meeting, the sanctuary, waiting for the meeting to start. And a woman walked up to me and said, That seat is taken. 
I just got up and moved. You know what? I thought me and all my high quality sobriety ain't coming back to this meeting. Oh, yeah. And then when the people discovered me and asked me to come speak, I told them what they did. Yeah. <laughs> so we, it's not even an out, and we have been a pioneer in Alcoholics Anonymous. A black man had a story in the book in Alcoholics Anonymous in 1955, 10 years before we passed the Civil Rights Bill. Mm -hmm. It just revolutionized. We've been pioneers, and we can continue to do that because the hand of AA ought always be available. I'm responsible for that. And so do I greet the people that I don't know in meetings? Do I make the people who look different than me feel welcome? Because that's what human affairs looks like that is talking about right here. By all the seeming evidence to the contrary that surrounds us in purely human affairs. How does that look? When gender matters and it shouldn't, or race matters when it shouldn't, or sex matters, these things shouldn't matter. Because we're supposed to be in the fellowship of the spirit. And how do I get there? Because I seek and then I glimpse God's will. And what is God's will? For me to be a channel of what? Truth, justice, and love. That's what is supposed to, that's my understanding. That's what I've gotten out of time that I've been here. Is that perfect? I don't know. No, it can't be. I'm human. Is it right? I don't know. I'm human. But, but I was invited to talk about my experience. In my experience, you know, like the disadvantage of being a drunk. Man, I thought it was the worst thing that could happen to me. It turned out that that disadvantage gave me an advantage. It forced me to surrender in a way that, you know, the friends that you have that lose their drink at a meeting, I mean, at a party, they put the drink down. They're like, oh, I don't know what happened to my drink. I never lost a drink in my life. There was never anything in the glass long enough for me to be worried about where the glass was. That's how I drank. I took my first drink at four years old. It was some of my mom's Schaefer beer. I asked if I could have some. She said, yes. Doorbell rang. She left me alone with the can. I finished it because even at four, I needed something outside myself. At eight, I decided that scotch was a good idea. And you might think that's a fluke, but by 13, I'm in bars ordering my own drinks. By the time I got here at 26, I was whooped. In this journey of bottoming out, in this journey of climbing up, reaching, always reaching for conscious contact, has allowed me, because I try to be an unsparing, unceasing evaluation of myself, not of you, because that don't do me no good, of myself. Not what did you do that disturbed me? What is it about me that's disturbable? You know, I had something happen to me that was really disturbing. And um, I got an opportunity to talk to Teresa about it. And then I got an opportunity to talk to Ali about it. You know, and, and both of them were so helpful. I'm not often injured. It's actually not that easy to injure me. It's really not. I'm a tough bird. Because life's been hard. But every now and then, right, I fall down, I scrape my knee, I cry. And to have people say, hey, remember, and I don't even know if Ali remembers what he said. He said, how sad that someone has to do that. Not what they did to me is sad, but how sad that we treat each other that way. And then it goes back to the sentence. that. No matter what the evidence is that's seeming to the contrary, what is real and eternal is justice and love and trust. I'm sorry, and truth. Those things are real and eternal. Even if I get my feelings hurt, even if things don't go my way, even if I get disappointed, even if nothing ever happened to me in Alcoholics Anonymous, actually in my life. All of things that have happened have happened for me. 
they've given me an opportunity to stretch out, to reach out, to grow towards the power, towards the conscious contact with the power. You know, it gives a whole new meaning to no pain, no gain. A whole new meaning. Recently, what's come up for me, and I'm going to read the the sentence again. The moment we catch even a glimpse of God's will. Once I got a, a, a glimpse of God's will, I just won't stop chasing it. Just a glimpse, not even a full look. A glimpse of God's will. I won't stop chasing God's will. I won't stop because I've seen it, even if for a moment. And what does it do? Again, the 12 and 12, page 105, last paragraph, middle. The moment we catch even a glimpse of God's will, the moment we begin to see truth, justice, and love as real and eternal things in life, not the hereafter, in life. I fell in love with with Aliyah on Zoom, and I gathered up people from my home group, and I was like, it's only eight hours. Let's drive to Toronto. And I drove to Toronto. I got to meet Kuna, I got to meet Nikki and Frank and Marty and, right? The joy of the fellowship we crave. And, and I get to, love is a verb in my life. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous has helped me come to. That it's not a feeling. I don't sit at home and say, oh, I love you. I do something in the material world, in the real world. It says these things are true in life, not in my head, in life. We are no longer deeply disturbed. Now, I'm still disturbed. I'm just not deeply disturbed. (laughs) I'm still disturbed, but I'm no longer deeply disturbed. I can move past it. I can pray past it. I can call people and they can help me get past it. I'm no longer deeply disturbed by all the seeming evidence to the contrary that surrounds me, that surrounds me in my job, in traffic. Oh, you want to see it in traffic, in a business meeting. Go to the business meeting for your home group. Go to the business meeting. Yeah. All of the seeming contradictions that truth, justice, and love are real and eternal. And I get to set them aside. I have to say that just in the 12 by 12, and I'm a big book girl, but just in the 12 and 12, I don't get to set this aside by mistake. I'm led to this. Let me, let me just bear with me. Here's my favorite sentence in all of the 12 and 12, page 92, page 92, the top of the second full paragraph. <clears throat> Finally, finally, yeah, it took me a while. Finally, we see, we begin to see that all people, including ourselves, are to some extent emotionally ill as well as frequently wrong. And then we approach true tolerance and see what real love for our fellows actually means. See, this, this topic that I've, I've, I've chosen for us tonight, the moment that we glimpse God's will, that we see that truth and justice and love are real, I don't get there without coming through the other steps. You know, the paragraph out of step 10 that I, that I, I read, further on it says, you know, hey, here's the deal. You love just a couple people, and then you hate a couple people, and the rest of the people you just ignore. And what kind of life is that? What kind of life is that? And what this is saying to me is, if I've followed the path that's laid out for me, 
if I picked up the spiritual tools that have laid at, laid at my feet. I've come to a place where there's no reason for me to be deeply disturbed by other people because like me, they're sick. And what can I do? I can bring love into it. I can bring love. I can try to be loved. Maybe I can't be loved towards them, but I can be loved out in the world. I, um, there are a couple of things, I, I, more things I want to say, and then I really want to open it up so that we can, we can talk. And if you think I have answers to questions, you probably are going to be very disappointed in me this evening, but let's see, let's see what happens. Um, I want to say that my experience with the sentence that I've read and my experience overall with the 11 step is that it's not a linear process. I, um, as I, I said, when I started, I am working with a nutritional therapist. And what Western medicine tells me is that it's really just about diet and exercise. If I could just lose a bunch of weight, if I could just eat right, I'm going to be okay. And, and what I've learned is that that's not the truth. That like everything else, like the spiritual journey, it's much more complicated, right? Am I getting proper sleep? Am I taking care of myself? Am I exposing myself unneeded, unnecessarily to situations that I find upsetting, even if I'm not conscious that they're upsetting? What, what, do I, what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about loving myself. I'm talking about caring for myself. Because again, I can't love you unless I can love me. The book tells me over and over, obviously, I cannot transmit something I haven't got. And so I'm wearing this continuous glucose monitor. And I got on a call with someone. And I didn't, I mean, it's not like my best friend, but I didn't feel a way about it, really. And my blood sugar shot up from 158, which is okay after you eat, to 220. And I tell the person I have to go. And I hit the therapist and I'm like, what is happening? And she said, well, what was, what was going on? And I said, well, I was on a call. And she explained to me that even if I don't have consciousness in my mind, and even if my body doesn't feel it, because that's how I've survived, that I will release cortisol and it will, it's like a fight or flight. And it'll release glucose and my blood sugar will shoot up. Because my body thinks I'm experiencing, oh, it's not safe here. I don't know if that made sense to anybody, but let me, let me tell you what I'm trying to say. That in order to be love, in order to be truth, in order to be justice, in order to have that be true and eternal, for me to exude that, for me to be a joy bringer, for me to be a peacemaker, for me to be the St. Francis prayer, right? For me to practice being that. There are certain things that have to be true for me. There are certain ways I have to take care of me, that I have to love me, not in a selfish, self-centered way, but in a basic fundamental self-care way. And sometimes I don't know that I'm not doing it that I need to learn 61 years old, 35 years sober, and I'm a new plateau. I'm learning that the kind of care and love I need to give myself is not how I look on the outside or necessarily even how I think I'm feeling. That I have to go deeper in a truer understanding of the vessel, the vessel that God has given me the gift of my body, the breath, the spirit needs a place to live. And am I taking care of that? Because it's a gift. When it fails, the spirit must leave. And if I want to be here and be a part of the solution in the world that surrounds me 
with a seeming denial of God's love, a seeming denial that God is real, that love is real. The only way for me to be able to do that is to experience that love both of myself and then surround myself with people who love me. To do what Teresa's like, hey, come on, let's cultivate friendship. And that doesn't happen as I often believe that it will, sitting on my couch watching Netflix. I, that's how I think it's going to happen. No, it doesn't happen like that. That it's an action. Love is a verb. I have to reach out. I have to call people. I have to make myself available. I have to take risks. And sometimes I have to unplug. Here's my last thought. I don't know how many minutes I've talked, but here's my last thought. I have lived in a way that is hiding in plain sight. By that, I mean that I'm a service warrior in Alcoholics Anonymous. A service warrior. My home group is the Bronx Big Book Study. We host 18 meetings a week. We have a flagship meeting that meets every single night at 9 p.m. It is a big book meeting. And you don't know where you're going to be in the book until I tell you the night before. So if you're not comfortable with the book, you don't want to do that meeting. And I booked a new big book speaker every night for two unbroken years. That's crazy. It's only now that I'm not doing it that I can see the insanity of that. Oh, and while I was at it, I did all the flyers. They're lovely. Yeah. Because what I realized is that what I do is I push love out to you. And what I'm doing is I'm hiding in plain sight. But when I'm doing that, the question is, am I loving me? Am I Am I spending the time that I need to with me and in my pursuit, my seeking of my relationship with the creator? The one that makes the sun rise and set. The one that makes the little fat yellow and black striped things that are mathematically incapable of flying. Bumblebees fly. Yeah. The miracle maker. Am I putting enough time into that? And and it's really hard to do that. If every moment is, I'm sponsoring double digit numbers of people. I've got eight service commitments. I'm blah, 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 blah. And, and that, and that, it's not that those things are not valuable. And it's not that those things are not good. But sometimes the way that I'm a demonstration of truth and love and justice is how I demonstrate self-care and self-love, how I demonstrate prioritizing time for me to be in commune with God. And I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm say saying is be selfish and self-centered and self-seeking. Oh, no, 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 no. I am not saying that. But I'm saying that like there's emotional balance. There's balance in sobriety. And if all I'm doing is pushing out, and I'm not properly feeding my spirit, then what am I hiding from? What am I avoiding? And, and it will show up. Whether I know it or not, it will sh it's shown up in a diagnosis I want. But thank God I know there's a way up and out. Thank God I know that there's a way to get help. Thank God I know that recovery of all types is possible. But it requires that I do the work. And in order to do the work, I have to love myself and trust God enough to have the courage to do the things I don't want. Like go to bed on time. Like eat on time. Little things. And I found that taking care of the shell demonstrates my care for my soul, which opens me up to be able to seek in a deeper and different way a connection with the power. Because really all I want is to be loved. All I want is for the people who cross my path 
to feel loved. That's really all I want. And I can't get that hiding in plain sight. I can't get that being a human doing. I have to use the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to become a human being. So I hope that um, that was not at all what I had in mind to say. That was what came through me. I hope that that was in some way meaningful. And um, if you think that that wasn't a proper Alcoholics Anonymous talk, my name is spelled O-L-I-S, and you can please put me in column one. Please call your sponsor. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.